What's out there? What's the world like? What's the stuff? How does it work? We're curious about it, right? And then what are we supposed to do with it? Now, today, contemporary, we're pretty comfortable with our answers. We know what's out there, we're scientists, we know how it works, and we know what we're supposed to do with it. We're supposed to use it to make life better for ourselves. This has not always been the case. And one of the things that happens when you study the history of science is you understand that science used to mean a whole bunch of different things. And one of the things that went on is that when we look at what's out there, what's out there actually changed radically, at least our interpretation. What's out there, as far as I can tell, didn't change. It's our, this is the discussion Jessica and I had last night, intense discussion. What's out there doesn't change, but our interpretation of what's out there changes radically. How does it work? And the ways in which we try to answer that question, how does it work, that has changed so significantly. How do we even go about coming to understand it? And what I'm going to talk about today is alchemy. And I want to make alchemy make sense to you. All right, I'll show you how that's going to go. And then what are we supposed to do with it? And this is where there's a big break between how we think today and how things were thought about under the guise of alchemy. Now, alchemy covers pretty much anything and everything that anyone would ever want to say about anything. Alchemy is huge and massive. Um, I could say it was part of theology, but there's a time when the church banned the study of alchemy. I could say it was the realm of very devout people, but then there's a whole bunch of charlatans who used alchemy to try to scam people out of money. So alchemy is all over the place. But, and also, alchemy is throughout pretty much all recorded time and pretty much in not every culture, but in lots of cultures, both Western cultures and Eastern culture. But for purposes of today, I'm going to talk about the alchemy that almost all of us know, which means I'm going to talk about the Monty Python version of alchemy. All right, this means I'm talking about alchemy in the Middle Ages. And so this is the standard turning lead into gold routine, basically. And it was practiced primarily by religious thinkers. And again, there's all sorts of exceptions to this, but for purposes of today, since alchemy is so broad, I am going to limit it and talk about alchemy in Europe in the Middle Ages. So, what's out there? We want to know what's out there. How does it work? We need to understand how it works. And what are we supposed to do with it? What is the proper relationship between us and what's out there? And you're like, these are easy questions. What I hope to show you is that the answers to these questions have changed significantly through the ages. So I want to make alchemy, the idea that we can turn lead into gold, I want to have that make sense. All right, now to do that, I have to go back 2,500 years. And so I've got to do this in about 30 minutes. So pay attention because it's going to go quick. The alchemist thought that what was out there was stuff that represented the mind of God. I mean, it's the physical world, but it is God's creation. All right, how does it work? And this is where it gets really tricky. There is no science as we understand it at the time. Alchemy is the precursor of chemistry, alchem, chemistry. And alchemy is an Arabic word, and it's not chemistry, but it's what chemistry was before chemistry was chemistry. And then what are we supposed to do with what's out there? What is the purpose of the physical world? And today, especially in Gillette, it's a resource, right? No. What is the purpose of the physical world for the alchemist? It is God's 
secret message to us. It is a way that God reveals his will to us. What are we supposed to do with it? We are supposed to study it under very certain conditions so that if we figure out how it works, then we have an insight into the mind of God. That was science before the scientific revolution. That's alchemy, all right? And what I want you to understand, hopefully by the end of my talk, is why it actually made sense for them to think that they could turn lead into gold and why they were trying to turn lead into gold. Were they doing it to make gold to get rich? No, they were doing it under the belief that gold is a pure form of lead, that lead actually grows and matures and can be advanced. Just as if you have a bunch of eggs that are fertilized and you want to get your chickens faster, you put them in an incubator and you keep them warm, and you can turn an egg into a chicken. It's not exactly how it goes, but you can turn lead into gold. And once you get lead, which was considered a contaminated version, once you advance it into gold, gold is the pure form of what God intended. And so once you have gold, you study gold, and then you see the mind of God and then you are worthy of entrance into heaven. So what are we supposed to do with coal? Not burn it for energy. We're supposed to turn it into gold so we can get into heaven. A bit different than how we think today. Now, my job is not to tell you about alchemy. That's the cool stuff about alchemy. And if you want to read about alchemy, oh my God, the stories about alchemy are just so amazing, so entertaining. What I want to do today, though, is to show you why this mindset, the mindset of the alchemist in the Middle Ages, why it made sense. Because my big goal today is to get you to understand that however we think at any time is in fact the result of a whole set of beliefs that probably we're not even aware of. We are not aware that we think that the external world is a resource because of all these other beliefs. It's just obvious it's a resource and we're to use it to make our lives better. But in the Middle Ages, it was obvious that the world is God's gift to allow us entrance into heaven. It made sense. So how is it that we get people like St. Thomas Aquinas, the leading Catholic theologian of all times. He was an alchemist. He bought into alchemy. Robert Boyle, the father of chemistry, Boyle's Law. If you know nothing else about Boyle, remember high school chemistry and you had to learn Boyle's Law and you have no idea what it means, but you remember the phrase Boyle's Law. Robert Boyle, he's considered the father of chemistry. He invented the steam engine and he was an alchemist. Isaac Newton, Sir Isaac Newton, the great patron scientist of England, founding member of the Royal Society, which is the place where all the scientists go in Europe, invented calculus, wrote Principia Mathematica, probably the greatest scientist of history. For 20 years, he locked himself away in a lab and practiced alchemy. All right? So it isn't that whack jobs or delusional people or scoundrels are alchemists. Some of the greatest minds ever were alchemists. So how is it that it's rational to be an alchemist? What is the thought that goes on behind it? And that is what is going to take me 2,500 years. All right, I have to tell you a story. Um, yesterday morning, I got up and I wanted breakfast. And I go out into my backyard, I have chickens, and I'm waiting for the chicken, her name is Miss Hilda. I'm waiting for Miss Hilda to lay the egg. And she hasn't done it yet, so I wait, and I keep looking. And finally the egg comes out of the back end of Miss Hilda, which is disgusting when you think about it. 
And, and I don't know if you know this, you probably do, but eggs are actually very soft when they come out of the chicken and they harden as soon as the air hits them. So here comes this thing out of the back end of the chicken. And I take it into the house and I crack it open. And out comes, it's an egg, right? Clear mucus. I don't like eggs, so to me it's like, ugh, clear mucus out of the back end of a chicken. All right, so here's this clear mucus. And I drop it into the hot oil in the pan, and eventually the clear mucus becomes white rubber, more or less. Again, I don't like eggs, so to me it's clear mucus and white rubber. Um, and nobody will ever eat eggs again. <laughs> and then the phone rings. And I go talk on the phone for a while, and I forget, and I come back, and everything is burned up, and there's just a pile of black ash. All right. Now, clear mucus, white rubber, black ash. Are there three different things? Did the clear mucus thing go out of existence and the white rubber thing come into existence? And then the white rubber thing goes out of existence and black ash comes into existence? Is that how it happened? Or do we think there is one thing that went through change? So the question here is, when the world takes on different appearances, are we dealing with replacement in existence, out of existence, into existence, out of existence? Or are we dealing with change, in which case there's one thing that is the same thing that stays the same even though it alters, it changes. So this is the very first philosophical question that was asked by a man in 600 BC, before the Common Era. His name was Thales. Not Thales, Thales. And he's considered the first Western philosopher. And he asked this question. Is there something that is the same throughout appearances? Is it possible for there to be change? Or is there only replacement and things flicker in and out of existence? And his answer was, no, no, no. There has to be a commonality. There has to be something that is stable throughout change. Now this is very problematic because basically what it means is there has to be something that stays the same while not staying the same. Think about that. Because what is it that's the same when it's clear mucus and white rubber and black ash? We don't think there are three objects. Look, you have the acorn that grows into the oak tree. We don't think there's thousands of different objects popping in and out of existence. We think it's one thing going through change. But what is that one thing? And for it to be one thing, it itself cannot change. Because if the one thing changes, then it's not the one thing, it's something else. But in order for it to be change rather than replacement, it has to stay there while altering. This is a huge philosophical problem. And it's considered the first philosophical problem. And it's called the problem of the one and the many. The problem of the one and the many. The one is the that which is there throughout all the changes, throughout all the different appearances. So also, look around the room. Because there's two aspects or two ways of putting the problem of the one and the many. This room is full of people. Each one of you looks different. Fortunately, there are no twins. It always screws up my lecture when there are twins. I used to have twins one time in teaching. It just caused, okay. You're all different, and yet you're all people. So here are the many, which is the appearance. All right? All this diversity. And yet, we are all the same kind of thing. We are all one. And I'm just going to jump ahead and call it reality. There is the fact of what it is to be a person. It's not how tall you are. It's not your shape. 
because we actually come in all sorts of different shapes. You can't say, well, two arms and two legs. No, people come without arms and legs. There is no shape that a person has to have. There is no color a person has to be. There's none of this, all right? And so what we're looking for is, apart from appearance, there must be a truth, a true nature, or an essence of what it is to be a person. Now, also look around the room. There are flesh things, you people. There are fabric things, the chairs. There are plastic things, the furniture. There are metal things, the camera. There's all sorts of different kinds of things, but we also think all these different kinds of things are somehow or another the same again. So, appearance, diversity, the many, we think there's something underlying it. So for all the things that exist, is there some reality by virtue of which all the things that exist are existing things? What is it that everything that exists has to have in common in order to be an existing thing? This is a really big metaphysical problem for philosophers, and it was the very beginning. Now, Thales came up with an answer, and the answer is embarrassing, okay? But I'm going to tell it to you anyway. His answer was, what is the one reality, the true nature or the essence of all things, no matter what they are? What is that reality? And his answer was water. You're like, really? Really? It's like, why did I get up on a Saturday morning for this? <laughs> but think about this. Water can be liquid. Water can be solid. Water can be gas. Water, or vapor. Water comes down from above. It comes up from below. Everything needs it. And so what he said was, just as the egg has different forms, but we think there is a truth of what egg is regardless of how it appears, he said everything is water. It just appears to us in different ways. That was Thales. And immediately after he said this, everyone jumped on him and said, that is stupid, that's wrong, no, no, no. And then we have this idea that, well, it couldn't be just one, we would need need two things, because so we need something to get things reacting. So we have water, and then we have the antithesis of water, like fire. And then other people said, no, 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 it's not water and fire, it's earth, air, water, and fire. The four elements, you've heard of this. Where did it come from? People taking what Thales did, saying there needs to be a reality underlying appearance. There needs to be the one that is the foundation of the many. Is it one thing, water, or is the one, which is reality, actually one is the combination of the interplay between water and fire? Or is it that there's tension between earth, air, fire, and water? All right, this is known as pre-Socratic philosophy, the philosophy before Socrates and Plato and Aristotle. And they argued this for a few centuries. And then along comes Plato. And Plato said, all of you people are just so wrong about all of this. Plato said what's really going on, and this gets pretty complicated, is that reality is actually divided. And so up here, we're going to have reality that's really real, and down here, we're going to have appearances. Now, he split the world into two worlds. This is known as the divided line. He divides reality into two worlds. Up here, he says we have what he calls forms. And the forms are the true nature or essence of whatever it is we want to talk about. And down here, we have particulars and the particulars can be things like lions and tigers and bears and a teaspoon and a candle and a sugar cube, whatever. And these are called sensible particulars. And the sensible particulars are called sensible because you grasp them through your senses. It's what you see. So it is the appearance. 
But what you see isn't real. What's real is the nature or essence. And Plato took the nature or essence of things and put them in a separate world. They are not physical. This is platonic form. Have you ever heard the phrase platonic love? And that basically means you're not going to get laid. Um, probably should have put that in a more delicate way. I teach the philosophy of sex and love. Believe me, for me, that was delicate. OK. <laughs> so platonic love is the nature of love as opposed to sensible versions of love. So think about this for a moment. I want you to think of something that is beautiful. Think of a red rose. Think of a beautiful woman, Angelina Jolie. Think of a beautiful man, Brad Pitt. Very convenient. Think of the Tetons on a winter morning right at sunrise when the snow just glows pink, right? Have you seen it? It's amazing. So the bighorns, whatever, right? Think of something that is beautiful. Now, what is it that a red rose, Angelina Jolie, Brad Pitt, and the Tetons on a snowy morning, what do they have in common? They're all beautiful. But can you say what it is that makes them beautiful? Now, I know you're going to say, well, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. I don't think Angelina Jolie is beautiful at all. Plato says you're wrong, OK? Plato says there is such a thing as beauty. Now, down here in the sensible particulars, I've got the rose, I've got Angelina Jolie, I've got Brad Pitt, and I've got the Tetons. I was an art major before I became a philosopher. It was a very good <laughs> career move. So the rose, Angelina Jolie, Brad Pitt, and the Tetons. These are beautiful things. But they, none of this, nothing in this side, on this damn level, none of it is beauty itself. But Plato said there is such a thing as beauty itself. And beauty exists in a separate realm, not in the world we live in. Beauty exists as a form in the realm of the forms. So think back to my silly little egg, right? Clear mucus, white rubber, black ash. In virtue of what is the clear mucus an egg? And the answer is, There is a form of egg. And the egg, at this point, is an egg, even though it's clear mucus, because it participates in eggness. And then when it's white rubber, it's still an egg, because it's still participating in eggness. And when it's black ash, if it is still an egg, it is an egg, because it's participating in eggness. All right? This is the metaphysics of Plato. If you study ancient philosophy, this is such an abbreviated version, but this is basically platonic metaphysics. Now, one thing to be very important, very clear about is the form egg is not itself an egg. So if I were going to do dogs, Lassie and a little Chihuahua and a St. Bernard and whatever, all the different dogs, I would say all the dogs are dogs because they participate in the form dog. They participate in dogness. They each have doghood. But it doesn't mean the form dog itself has four legs and a tail. It's not the form is like best of show. It is this idealized notion of the true nature or essence. All right? That's platonic metaphysics done very, very quickly. Now, along comes Aristotle. And Aristotle said, this doesn't work. One thing you should be very clear about, the history of philosophy. History of philosophy is somebody saying, hey, i got a problem, but I think I can solve it. And then centuries of people going, no, that won't work. Here's a better solution. No, that won't work. Here's a better solution. That's just how we work. All right, Aristotle comes along. And Aristotle says, what's wrong with all of this is that, Plato, you have separated the form from the thing in such a way that there is no explanation of how the two are connected. This line that Plato has, this divided line, Aristotle says is far too extreme, and we need to get rid of it. So Aristotle gets rid of it, 
And so when Aristotle says, here's a beautiful thing, why is it beautiful? Not because there's beauty in a separate realm, but because it has beauty in it. It has the form in it. And so what Aristotle has done is taken essences that Plato put in a separate realm, not of the physical world at all. Aristotle took them and said, the forms are in the thing itself. So here's a dog. Trust me, that's a dog. Here's a dog. Why is it a dog? Plato says because it participates in dogness. Aristotle said, what does it mean to say it participates? And Plato said, oh, I don't really know. And I said, well, then you've got a bad theory if you can't explain it. So what Aristotle wants to do is say dogness is not some abstract entity that exists elsewhere. Dogness is part of what it is for this thing to exist. And then Aristotle goes on and says, let's get rid of Aristotle and, woo, Aristotle and Thales. What Aristotle says is, if you want to understand something, now we can go back here. What's out there? How does it work? Plato said what's out there are just sensible particulars and in a different realm entirely that we can't access while we're in this world, there are forms. So what's out there? For Plato, reality is not out there. Reality is in a different realm entirely. What's out there are sensible particulars that participate in reality. How does it work? Plato said, I don't know. Aristotle said, then you've got a stupid theory and we can ignore you. So Aristotle said, what's out there? For Aristotle, what's out there is the form and the stuff itself, the physical stuff, what he calls matter. So what's out there? Now, how does it work for Aristotle? That anything that is, is a combination of form and matter. And there's a very fancy word, and since it's a university, I'll give it to you. Hylomorphism. And hylomorphism is simply the Greek word for form, matter, combined. So how does it work? How is reality? Reality is constructed of form and matter combining. The stuff out of which something is made and the nature of the thing. So I have a desk. The form of the desk is the shape. The matter of the desk is wood. Combine them, you get a wooden desk. If I had the same matter, wood, and I combined it with a different form, I would get a chair. And so Aristotle said, we want to know about world. And Aristotle is really the first one to do what we would consider science. And Aristotle said, if you want to know how anything works, you have to then know the four causes. And so Aristotle said, forget earth, air, fire, and water, and all that bit. What you really want to know is the formal cause. What kind of thing is it? What is its form? What is its shape? What does it look like? You want to know its material cause. What is it made out of? What kind of stuff is it? What's the difference between me and a mannequin? A mannequin has the same form that I do, but it's made out of plastic, I'm made out of flesh. I am as I am because of my form and my matter. If my matter were different, I would be a different being. If my form were different, I would be a different being. I am flesh with a human form. I could be flesh with a dog form, and then I'd be a dog. All right? And if it were a dog form made out of styrofoam, it would be a mannequin dog. Then I have the efficient cause. And the efficient cause is what brings something into being. OK? What brought it into being? So the efficient cause of the desk is the carpenter. The efficient cause of me, my parents had sex. And they'll see this video and they'll be horrified. OK. 
but surely they know they had sex. All right, now, and then we get to the final cause, which is the most important one. The final cause is basically why. Why does this exist? And for Aristotle, this answer was it exists because it is its nature. And so you get tied back in with form here, talking about essence. But basically, what Aristotle is talking about is something called telos. And telos is a Greek word, and it means its aim, its end, its goal, its purpose, its reason for being. And for Aristotle, everything that is, it has the type of thing it is, the type of stuff it's made out of, how it came to be, and why it came to be. And for Aristotle, this is science. And so you simply come to understand things for their own sake, to simply know why they are as they are. This is science. This is it. Now, you can go on and do stuff with whatever it is you figure out. But for Aristotle, that was craft. All right? Luck, he, had, he drew a distinction between luck craft, and art. Luck is you put something on the water and it didn't sink, and you went, wow, huh, that's luck. Craft is you figured out if you shape it this way, it won't sink. So you figure out how to build a boat, right? Luck, you got a piece of wood to float. Craft, you know if you keep making it this way, it's going to float. Art, Art is you figure out why that particular curve allows it to float, whereas this curve doesn't. So craft, you just replicate what worked before. Luck, you got it to work. Craft, you replicate what you got to work. Art, you understand why it works. And science and art, for Aristotle, same thing. And if you know the four causes, you know what it is to know something. You have science knowledge. Now, the big thing here is telos, nature. All right? Now, what happens is Aristotle did all this. It's really cool stuff. Life is going on. It's all very good. And then, and then, <sighs> things kind of went to hell in a handbasket. And it's called, quite frankly, Christianity. What happened is the Dark Ages, right? What happened was Christianity, the Catholic Church, the rise of the Catholic Church, wanting to get rid of pagan philosophy. So they went after it, and they destroyed as much of it as they could. And it was the Arabic and the Jewish philosophers who scrambled to save the work of the ancient Greek philosophers. And then we have the Dark Ages, and not a whole lot went on. That's why they're called the Dark Ages. And eventually, the Catholic Church became very powerful, had well-developed theology, Catholic theology, and allowed for Plato and Aristotle to be reintroduced. But it had to be reintroduced in a way that fit with Catholic theology. So all of medieval philosophy, what we might call scholastic philosophy, it's called scholastic because the only people who were educated were the people taught by the schools, um, and those were the priests. So scholastic philosophy, medieval philosophy, for now we can equate it all the same. And what was going on in the medieval time period is you're taking Plato's metaphysics, Aristotle's metaphysics, primarily Aristotle's metaphysics, combining it with Catholic theology and getting a whole science and a theology and a philosophy. They didn't draw any distinctions. And what happens is, when you get down here with the telos or the why, what you end up with is God's will. Aristotle just said, it's the nature of things. This is what it is to be a dog. Under Catholic theology, a dog is as God wants the dog to be. All right? 
With telos, the idea is that every single thing is striving to fulfill its nature. And also, everything has a form, which is the essence, right? And everything is striving, telos, striving to get to the fulfillment of its natural state. Now, you take this and combine it with the idea that God created everything, Catholic theology. If God created everything and God is all good and all powerful, then the world is as God wants it to be. But God had to make it of matter. It's of the physical stuff. And the physical is the contaminated, right? God is pure. God is not physical. Physical is contamination. Um, humans have all these base urges. This is their physical nature that is contamination. But the form is the true nature, the essence. God is after essence. That's what God really gave us. So if everything is striving to fulfill its nature, and there's an essence there, then if we can hurry things to their natural end, we will have the essence revealed to us. We can separate it from its matter, and the mind of God will be revealed to us. So how are they going to do this? And this is alchemy. The alchemists want to hurry nature. And they also want to purify nature. And so what the alchemists do is they have what's called a philosopher's egg. The philosopher's egg is a very large, basically mud and straw and dung vat, huge, huge vats. And you dig a deep, deep hole in the ground, and you fill it full of all this charcoal and wood, and you start burning and burning and burning, and you get it as hot as you can. You put this big mud vat in there, and you fill it full of all sorts of chemicals, lead or anything else. Um, and then you put in other chemicals. Well, they, aren't, they weren't chemicals. Minerals and catalysts, things that will get a chemical reaction, but they didn't think of them as chemical reactions. They didn't have chemistry at the time. But you then have the egg, which is the incubator, and you have something called the philosopher's stone. Which is the catalyst. And the philosopher's stone, um, it's secret. I mean, alchemy is full of secrecy. And the reason alchemy is so full of secrecy is because you're trying to get to know the mind of God. And the idea is God's not going to reveal that to just anybody. Part of the scientific revolution is, hey, anybody can go out and do an experiment and come to know the way the world is. That's the revolution. Before the revolution, it was what's really out there will only be revealed to those who have proven themselves worthy to God for God to let them in on some of the secrets. So, we have the Philosopher's Stone. No one's quite sure what it is. And when you read all these texts on alchemy, there's so many arguments about what it is and is there such a thing? And do you spend your life questing trying to find the Philosopher's Stone? But in general, there seems to be some agreement. The Philosopher's Stone is a catalyst. Typically, it was cinnabar, but it also quite often was mercury, known as quicksilver. And what you do is you take a bunch of minerals, dump them into this philosopher's egg, dump some of the philosopher's stone, and again, it's very controversial if anyone ever had this, but basically chemicals that will cause reactions, seal the vat, and then cook it for up to six weeks at a time. And to prove that you're worthy of God revealing anything to you, you would purify the body, purify the soul, you would fast, and you would pray. So you would spend about six weeks breathing in mercury vapor fumes without eating, hoping that God would reveal himself to you. He did a lot to everybody. 
Um, they also tended to get lots of brain tumors from breathing mercury vapors because the egg was made out of mud. I mean, it didn't seal tight. But here's the thing. They would open the egg up every so often, and all of this stuff would have floated to the surface, right? And they would skim it off. And the idea is the essence is the true nature of the thing you're trying to get at. And the true nature cannot be separated from the thing itself. So if you can cook this stuff and something will float to the surface and you can skim it off, then clearly that's not the essence. So you just keep doing this and doing this and doing this, trying to get as many what we would call now chemical reactions to separate the impurities. And eventually at the end of several weeks of doing this, you're left with a very small amount of something that is considered pure. And if you take lead, the idea was that lead and gold were all the same form. They were just of a different matter. And you could hurry lead along to its final cause. And you could get lead into gold. And that simply meant that you had got lead to mature into gold. And if you cooked lead correctly, what you would end up with would be gold. Not because it was worth money, but because it was the true expression of what God intended. And you could then study it and come to know the mind of God. That's why alchemy makes sense. It's in this framework. Now, there are problems, of course, because when Aristotle talked about essence, he never meant that it was something you could see. And he says hylomorphism. You can't separate form from matter. But the alchemists were trying to get form separated from matter because then they would have the purity. And they would know the mind of God without any contamination of the physical. All right? That's alchemy. That's why it makes sense. So when we flip back here, what's out there? Well, God's creation, but in a contaminated form because it's messed up with the physical world. How does it work? Well, let's get the pure stuff and then study it and pray, and God will reveal to us how it works because we have proven ourselves worthy by pursuing God's truth. And what are we supposed to do with it? Get into heaven. All right? This is the way science was done. This is theology. This is philosophy. This is science. This is alchemy. Until the scientific revolution. And the scientific revolution happened when the church began to lose control. And then there was scientists who practiced science apart from religion. And what these scientists said was that we can do a study of the world quite apart from theology. The scientific revolution has a few components. One is the world is out there in a way that anyone can access. The world is not hidden from the unworthy. Anyone can do science. The idea is that the world is stable, that the world doesn't change around on us, that there are a fixed number of laws, and these laws, they're fixed, they don't change, there's only a certain number of them, so it's not incomprehensible. And the laws that govern the world are such that the human mind is capable of coming to understand them, any human mind. And so, to figure out what's out there, you don't do philosopher's eggs, philosopher's stones, and purify your soul. You simply wash the test tubes and do the experiment. That's the scientific revolution, and that's my talk. Thank you. Yes, they did. They did. Um, it kept them going because if you do this cooking it down, you do end up with stuff. 
Um, if you go into any herbal shop, you get essence of lilacs and essence of violets and essence of eucalyptus. And what is that? It's stuff that you've cooked down. And they would cook all this stuff down. And there's so many different recipes. They would cook it down. They would actually end up with something. And they would call it gold. And part of the problem was their arguments over who had gold. And some of them say, I have this. This is what gold really is. Because the gold on our jewelry, well, no, of course, that's not gold. And so there were, at one point, um, John Locke, who was one of the leaders of the scientific revolution, argued that the philosophers by science, which is another name for an alchemist, the philosophers of science, I'm so sorry, I said that wrong, the philosophers by fire, that's the phrase I need, the philosophers by fire have 26 very distinct definitions of gold. So whatever they ended up with, one of them would define it as gold, and then the other one would cook something else, and what he ended up with, he would define as gold. And they would say, well, God told me this is gold. No, God told me you're wrong, this is gold. It's a religious debate then. So did they end up with stuff? Yeah. What did they end up with? It caused brain tumors. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Did the alchemists ever talk with metallurgists, uh, such as the, uh, you know, uh, the ancients you know, who made armor for battle? Mm -hmm. They would refine metals uh, yeah. for armor plate swords. And, yeah. You know, the Austrians and the Germans. Oh, yeah, all of that. Bronze Age, Iron Age. Yeah. yeah. All of that was going on, but this gets into the question of what are we supposed to do with it? And it's also the difference between science as part of theology, philosophy science, versus technology. So when I say the first real scientist was Aristotle with the four causes, it's not like before that nobody had done a study of how to get crops to grow better. It's not like they didn't practice it. But that would be considered technology. What are we supposed to do with it? Use it to make our lives better. So they knew that all this stuff was going on, but it wasn't being able to create armor of different types of metal. That was information that they might have used in trying to then get to the nature or essence of something. Of course the information was out there. Of course they talked. But the metallurgists, a lot of them were also alchemists. And one of the things that's fascinating in the history of alchemy um, one of the most famous alchemists is a man named Paracelsus. And Paracelsus, I mean, he's famous and he was supposed to have lived for several hundred years and people still think he's running around doing magic. Um, he actually developed some really useful medical cures in pursuing all of this stuff. Useful information came about, but then it got separated from the gull. So this is the third question. What are we supposed to do with this information? Some people who weren't the alchemists, who weren't trying to do science, did technology and got some practical benefit from it. And so it would be the difference here between science and technology. Technology, I would say, would be the applied science. And for the, alchemy, it's, for the alchemist, it's very much a theological quest. Yes? The theory of atoms is very, very old. Democritus, um, so a pre-Socratic and Plato, Aristotle time, that was certainly there. And then you get Dalton and more in the 18th, 19th century. Um, with the scientific revolution of Boyle and Newton and John Locke and Galileo, it was not an atomic theory at all. It's what was called corpuscularianism. Um, and a corpuscle is simply supposed to be the smallest particle of matter. And so it would have been an atom, but it wouldn't be atomic theory as we understand it, because at the time they were writing, they had no concept of force and bonds, and that came much later. But the idea that matter gets broken down into very tiny particles is 3,000 years old, resurrected right around the time of the scientific revolution by Boyle, Locke, Hobbes. Newton, and then really developed once we get into the idea of bonds and forces, which comes later. Other questions? Okay, I think my time is up. All right. Thank you.